So, thank you, Bruno, for a great lecture. Interesting as always. And maybe also some questions from out here. We have some in the back. Just raise your hands and Rebecca and Anna will get to you. And try to speak loud and put it quite shortly. Yes, please. Hi. Uh, yes, you've talked about uh, joining ideologies, concepts uh, in, in a, an objective stage. And there's been some dispute over most of these ideologies or concepts and even the objective stage itself as to how accurate they may be. Um, I do see a lot of the uh, a fusion and, a, and a, maybe a composition existing within each perception, with each, within each subjectivity. Um, and, and I see a challenge of bringing those together. When you talk about futures and, and prospects relating to these subjective views, how important do you see the aspect of optimism, or to use a bolder word, faith? Optimism. Uh, first, my argument is not about subjective. My argument is about for 35 years now, I've tried to, to do the anthropology of the modern and to try to understand how the same people who had multiplied their link their linkage between humans and non-humans to an extraordinary degree, to the point of being coextensive with the planet, had a philosophy of their own, a philosophy of science first, but then a general philosophy of a greater and greater disconnect between subjectivity and objectivity, okay? So that's my paradigm, I mean, my agenda. I try to understand how the same people can live with two completely different theories and this is why I say the whites have always a four cut tongues. Because they, 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 they always did something entirely different from what happened. Now, this situation is now finished because of the ecological crisis. The disconnect, at least the disconnect is recognized and I think the Copenhagen event was so interesting for that. It's the end of a certain idea about the disconnect. So it's not a subjective argument. Now, I mean, it's subjective, it, it's constructed. I hope it's well composed, but it's not about subjectivity. So what I'm interested in here is in the, 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 the shift to try to get at your uh, question. I mean, to talk about optimism and pessimism would be a bit moot. I mean, when you read uh, Lovelock, he says, Gaia's carrying capacity is 300 million. And he never says how you move from 300, from eight or nine billions to 300 millions. So is Lovelock a pessimist or an optimist? Uh, Gaia doesn't seem to be, as he says, you cannot win against Gaia. We are in war and we lose if we win and we lose if we gain. No, Lovelock is clearly not an optimist in that sense. So I'm, not, I'm less interested in optimism and pessimism than what does it mean to have shifted from a future which was always hyped in some sort of sense, even when it was dystopia, it was hyped, to a prospect. And I think that's, that's the switch I'm trying to, to get. And for some strange reason, I'm sure lots of people would disagree, I, I see Avatar, actually the film, as a, as a very clear symptom of that shift. Remember the last, I mean, I don't know if you have, have you seen Avatar? <laughs> You're probably the only one in this room, I have not done. <laughs> well, I won't ask, I won't ask. But the last, the last image is quite amazing in terms of optimism and pessimism because you see the, 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 the front line is withdrawing. They withdraw from the planet. And I think it's a very powerful indication that something is changing in the very definition of what it is to be optimist and pessimist. To be optimist and pessimist when we're the future it's not the same thing as to be optimist and pessimist when we are now facing a prospect, things to come. And actually, the very interesting feature of Gaia is actually it comes at us. It comes at us that it doesn't look even at us. So it's a very different type of anthropology necessary to absorb Gaia's myth, in my view. I hope I sort of tiptoed around your question, please. Okay, thank you. No, it's not on. Yes, it is. Is it on? Yes, no, it's on. Okay. Uh, I have a very, very simple 
question actually. Uh, I would like to know a little bit more about the, um, the difference between constructivism and uh, compositivism. Um, uh, you said something in the beginning about compositivism having kind of an aesthetic rung to it or, or associations to it. Is, is that where you're driving? I mean, what, what would be the exact difference between the notion of constructivism that you have explored earlier and that you mentioned sometimes today too and, and this, well, I don't know if it's entirely new, but to me new notion of uh, compositivism. First, um, it's the same basic notion, but I think in the field, of, which is my original field of science studies, we tried everything around construction and always failed, so to speak. Because construction, whatever, I mean, even if you extract yourself from social construction, uh, remains um, taken always in, is it true or is it constructed? I mean, there is no way out of it. So this is why... Maybe, maybe I will fail with composition, but uh, I, I now, that is the same argument, which is, can we shift the discussion between construct, is it true or is it constructed, which works for no practice, especially not for scientific practice, of course, not for technology and so on, to the question, is it well or badly constructed or well or badly composed? But I think the very reason is the one you mentioned, which is that composition has a nice aesthetic aspect of it, and um, I'm very interested actually now in the link between the whole ecological discussion, science studies and aesthetics, because I think a lot of, the, a lot of those questions are also aesthetic. I mean, cosmos, after all, is an aesthetic term, even in the Greek. It means a well-organized, a well-composed, a well-adjanced, a well... Uh, a w <laughs> very strong uh, composition is the value in the very notion of cosmos. So I think c composition might given a different flavor than construction. And also because I've used construction so much and, <laughs> and uh, always having to discuss with people, I, yeah, 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 but is it true or is it constructed? And uh, no, wait, wait, it's not the question, is it well constructed? But it works for technology, doesn't work so well for science and so on. So this is, I'm trying composition. I might fail, of course, but be, being able to fail is what is good in those two terms. Well-constructed things can fail, also. I mean, that's, that's, that's the key thing. Uh, hello, thank you for your talk. Um, one thing I'm a little confused about is how we negotiate the politics of ambiguity. The, polit the, the politics of ambiguity, by which I mean we, we have in the climate gate the idea that there's no absolute truth. but. Uh, this, uh, and this has been used in a kind of reactionary way to make people very apathetic and that they, they can't really go forward. But at one point, we have to deal with some kind of hierarchy of truths. For example, technological choice, choosing a windmill versus a jet fighter. This is the kind of practical choices uh, Sweden's had to deal with in terms of their uh, technology policy. So how do we uh, embrace an idea of truth uh, without falling into this, uh, the, the problems that, that you've dealt with in your research, absolutism? Uh, and I'm also wondering if your, your metaphor for the backward versus the forward is just another way of bringing up the truth, the idea of a truth which admittedly is subjective without using the word truth. I, I didn't get the second one, sorry. The, uh, it seems that the way you use the word, the, this metaphor of, of moving backward and looking uh, backward with, uh, when you move backward or not, th there seems to be something in that that seems to be related to the old idea of what, what a truth is. You see, I mean, on the one hand, there's the, the, the classic problem that people like Wallerstein talk about is that, you know, you can't go too far with the idea of the absolute truth, but if you engage in relativism, that's demobilizing. People become apathetic. So I'm wondering if there's, you know, uh, we should salvage part of the modern, modernist project. Because what I see very, very practically as uh, someone in the universities, a lot of people are very, very apathetic because they, they have been affected by a postmodern yeah. ambiguity. So the ambiguity, which at one point it became critical, becomes less critical. Well, that's, that's a quite important question. I, the way I get into that, but not in this paper except a very brief allusion, is that the, the ambiguity of action, maybe much, much in the French scene, which is quite interesting in that respect, is around the notion of precautionary principle. Because 
pre the precautionary principle, which uh, you might not know that, but in, it's in the French Constitution. It has been inserted in the French Constitution, which is very odd, because the French are harsh modernists. But President Chirac, for some strange reason no one understood, did absolutely nothing for eight years, except that thing, <laughs> which is extremely surprising. And the interesting thing of a precautionary principle is that it sort of makes legal and institutionalize exactly the ambiguity you are talking about, which is energy to act is not actually depending on knowing. And that's a very interesting thing, and it's a complete surprise to the French. It, it was created uh, actually very, uh, the reason why it was so uh, important was during the tainted blood scandal. Because during the whole tainted blood scandal, the French biologists said, as long as we are not sure, we don't stop. So for the first time, people realized when that their definition of action was always based on the notion of knowledge. When you know, you act. When you don't know, you don't act. And the idea of acting while you don't know, that's exactly what is, based, what is, what is built on the very interesting idea of a precautionary principle. So to come back to the climate gate, an application of a precautionary principle would, in my view, have helped use the ambiguity you're talking about by saying, we don't know, and we vote the laws of nature. The laws of nature are at least the set of action which is now necessary to bend the trend, as we said, in Copenhagen, is not based on absolute knowledge. It's based on precautionary principle. And then you could have some... So, of course, the, 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 very, the very important question you raise is that if we don't know, we are stuck. We are demobilized, I think is the word you use, right? And I think that it's a very odd definition of action because black action is, I mean, I'm completely Dewayan here. I'm a complete pragmatist here. The, the pragmatist tradition is precisely you don't know, thus you act and you learn from the consequence of your action. And you could perfectly have imagined a very, I mean, this is a scenario, of course, completely, uh, uh, invented by me, but where uh, the, the, the skeptics, why do you laugh when I say that? <laughs> where the skeptic would have been without force if we had say, we don't know, there are lots of sciences produced, I mean, all the science study type of thing. We decide that for the next five years, for this is an undisputable, undisputable, end of a discussion. For five years, the, entropy, the laws of nature Entropic cause of cl gr uh, climate, uh, clim uh, global warming is decided upon. So, and I think that's where the, the whole, the whole uh, interest of a precautionary principle it gives back to action a spring, an energy which is not based on knowledge. You see what I mean? It's mo mobilization is not linked to that. And I think, it's a, uh, of course, none of our action is based constantly on knowledge. I mean, it would be only the French have believed that. <laughs> but when you know, when you act, it's only because you know, and when you don't know, you don't act. I mean, this is a very odd definition. Of, no one you would use it for anything like marrying, having kids, uh, eating. I mean, we we'd never use it except when science and technology is, is, is invoked. And the, the great sanity of the principle of precaution is that it brings back many other definitions of what it is to act and many spring for action than waiting for the scientists to agree, which is rarer and rarer now because of the number of lobbies producing uh, spurious sciences on the one hand. I mean, remember the cigarette, uh, uh, the cigarette cancer uh, connection, but also because science and technology have extended everywhere. So you can't expect now to have a notion of mobilization and demobilization based on knowledge. Not because we don't know, of course we know a lot, but we know matters of concern, no longer matters of fact. Uh, or we know in a matters of concern way, not in a matters of fact way. So the whole divide between what is mobilization and what is demobilization is being modified. Now, I agree with the second question. I have to think of that more because, of course, it reused the trope of modernism quite a lot by moving. Right, that's what you meant. Uh, I think I passed on that one. 
Thank you. Uh, I have two small questions. The first one is uh, uh, against the background of your uh, attempt to sort of depict a, a total uh, social structure, um, ideology, or whatever you might call it, uh, which is a risky business, of course. Uh, a risky business. I mean, to talk about modernism and the modernists uh, exposes you to the risk of uh, making a little bit more precise. Who are you talking about? Uh, sometimes uh, you seem to be trying to, to, to grasp a whole kind of social structure. Sometimes there is perhaps a person behind. I was wondering whether you were thinking of Habermas or someone else. Um, who are you talking about? It seems there is a risk of making a parody, in fact, of talking about entire social structures in, in this way. And, and your, your talk was, in, in some respects, a little bit parodical from that point of view, I, I think, in talking about modernism. Um, my second question is uh, perhaps related to that. Uh, and that is, uh, how could you know, it's a very simple question, how could you know that uh, being, the world, or whatever, all that there is, is discontinuous? How do you know? How do I know? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I know. <laughs> well, the first question is, uh, the word on modernism, I mean, of course, Dealing with modernism is always too big, but I've simplified in, we have never been modern to a very simple point, which is, uh, is m modern not, not a social structure, not an event, not a moment, uh, but a certain way to divine science from society? So the, the divide, the history of the divide, of the division between science and society is my shibboleth to describe who is modern and who is not modern. So, more philosophically, of course, it can be, uh, and that might be too grandiose, even more grandiose than what I did here, is a whited argument about the bifurcation of nature. Basically, everyone who believes in the primary secondary equality is modern. Everyone who's doubted, everyone who doubts it is not. Everyone who thinks there is, we go beyond, is postmodern. Right? I mean, these are little, little tests. And then you can try yourself. Uh, it's, it, it's actually a quite nice, it, it works. Sometimes, most time it works, sometimes it doesn't work to describe. We have never been modern. We have never been modern. So it's not a moment in history, it's not a set of practice. To have been modern would have meant that the, the practice of science would have actually been able to distinguish the two, humans and non-humans. So, but now there is a much better way to define it, which is to use Descola's uh, argument, because Descola's anthropology is much, much more solidly established than mine, and uh, is based on very, very large uh, on, uh, ethnographic literature. The problem with Descola, we call it naturalism, uh, is that for the European, it's based on philosophy of science. And for the others, it's based on ethnography. So there is a slight problem with Descola's uh, argument. As you know, no one has ever been able to define a moment where we were modern or we stopped to be. So we have never been modern, that solves the question. But we believe we were, or sometimes we believe we were. And actually the whole history of a, the rare moment when you can pinpoint those who were modern, who believe they were modern, becomes very interesting. And there is now a whole uh, literature on that. Now, on the other question, which is, of course, a metaphysical question, so, I mean, it's not based on knowledge. Here, again, I rely on Whitehead, because you remember Whitehead's argument is that the bifurcation of nature begins somewhere between the 17th century, Locke, let's say. I mean, it's Galileo's who make it a technical thing, which Locke make it a philosophical argument. And for Whitehead, it stops with James, basically. I mean, James is the one that closed the parenthesis opened by Locke. And Whitehead begins to define event. And it's with event, basically, that's what I alluded to by this notion of discontinuity. The only thing I add to the argument of Whitehead is, is its political dimension, which Whitehead was no interest, has no interest in politics. It's clear that when you add the notion of continuity of the laws of nature, you establish a polity. And a large part of what we did in science studies was to show 
a connection between the definition of matter and the definition of polity. Very early on, I mean, in 30 years ago, in the first work of the 17th century, Hobbes, of course. So there is a very interesting connection which White doesn't do between the definition of what is the polity in which we, are, we all are, humans, non-humans, etc., and the definition of that scientists, philosophers of science give of matter. So this is where I put my little finger there and say, okay, if we have a polity that organizes the continuity so well that it's already there, it doesn't have to be composed. 90% of the political process is moot because we are already assembled. We are already composed. You see the point? And that's where, of course, we didn't, it was not so interesting before the ecological crisis. But when the ecological crisis begins, and people begin to say, well, save the whales, or save the tuna fish, the red tuna, sorry, only the red tuna. Then we begin to realize that this organization of all these species was a composition. Even the very, uh, there was a very interesting uh, meeting in Paris last week on biodiversity. Even the very notion of biodiversity is a compositionist argument now. Because every species begins to have also its lobby. So we have a double composition, that of ecosystem and that of polity. So everywhere there are little, there are little disconnections where political process enter into the definition of what nature is. And that's where, that's how I know, <laughs> I know, the discontinuity of all beings. But if I want to talk about all beings as a metaphysician, I will rely on Whitehead. Now, if I want to talk about political ecology, I would be on safer ground and say, okay, well, why is Mr. Sarkozy into the question of tuna fish? <laughs> why, when you begin to look at nettles, I found recently nettles. There is a whole European lobby around nettles. Is it nettle, orti? This thing, is it a, do you have nettles around here? Okay. Well, it has a lobby. Believe it or not, nettles, nettles have a lobby. So even nettles, which I thought was really, I mean, little, not very interesting matters of fact, is becoming a matter of concern. When I was doing an exhibition, making things public, I asked Lauren Daston. She said, we have to have the last matter of fact celebrated into, ex into your exhibition. And I told Rennie Daston, who is a great historian of science, well, found one, a good one, a good last matter of fact, the undisputable, uninteresting, unconnected, unpoliticized fact of nature. And since she's very good and a very good historian, every time she had one, she found connections, she found postmodern connections. We tried rocks, and of course, the whole of geology came in. And at the end, we had an empty box we couldn't find the last undisputable, uninteresting, unhistorical, unanthropological matter of fact. The one you eat, you know, oh, sorry. <laughs> the one you really, you could bump on it and it would resist without any sort of interesting connections. I mean, it's very interesting because below here you have another, it's called the Networks of Innovation. It's actually a marvelous exhibition, completely actor network, by the way. And Again, I mean, every single element of Nobel history spread in all sorts of things. That's why I know. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry for the parody, though. I'm, I Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation, Professor Latour. Uh, I'm, uh, I find it really interesting that your uh, uh, work the past years has become more overtly, overtly political than before. I mean, it's always been about politics and the politics of science, but it's, it's moved into more the cosmopolitan uh, dimension and coming into questions of how to compose a better world uh, for all of us. And you've written a lot about uh, domination and a little bit also about the corollary of domination, which is subjugation. Uh, but I find it that reading your work, a lot of the times looking at sort of the conceptualization of violence, it's still very much about being civilized. It's in this course a lot of the violence, even though you write about putting symmetry between things and, and subjects and humans, it's still, when we look at violence, we never 
often I, I believe, find it, see the really messy, ugly end results of physical, corporeal violence. And we, if we are looking at how to compose a good common world to live in together, I'm really interested in if you are ever thinking about tackling the subject of physical violence, of corporeal violence, and of violence of humans against humans, of things against humans, and of humans against things, because I think it's kind of key. I think it's difficult to tiptoe around this question if you want to really get into the dirt of how to compose the, the common world. And, and as a corollary to this, I would also like to ask you, uh, in your cosmopolitical thinking, uh, there's this really sticky, tricky term of liberation. How would that come in? Liberation of people and liberation of non-people. <laughs> A too huge uh, question. Well, attachment. I mean, there is a disconnect. One, in, among the disconnect I'm interested is the one between emancipation and attachment. So there was in the, the, the great virtue and beauty of a modernist front, front. I mean, even in this Ford movement was, of course, emancipation, and it still is for masses of people, of course, emancipation is still the word. But then we also have the other word, which is attachment. So uh, what I'm interested in is in the, again, I'm, I'm doing the anthropology of the modern. I mean, there's a problem of limiting where they are, of course, but I have answered this question somewhat. And all of that is the contradiction between the, stu, the, disc, the discourse of a trope of emancipation and the one of attachment. Now, the one which is associated with emancipation is critique. And I'm, I've, become, I've become very suspicious of the word critique. And I, I said several times that critique has run out of steam precisely because of what I said about nature. And that has a bearing on the, second, on the first question, which is why I don't insist on violence. Well, first, thanks. Because, of course, I've been criticized for exactly the opposite thing, which is I brought violence into the heart of a peaceful science and technology, which is supposed to be a haven out of which we will escape violence by eluding and getting to finally matters of fact are there that you like them or not. And again, bumping on the table is very important at this point. So what I prefer, but I, I agree, it's, it's more sort of a... Well, I agree with your criticism in, some, in, in many ways. I, I, I you have more work to do, that's great. Yes, I have more work to do. <laughs> But I, I'm also very suspicious of negativity. This very concept which has been invented, uh, there is a beautiful book on that, um, on the total revolution by Bernard, I forgot his, his last name. Um, so I, I'm very suspicious of the ease with which the word critique and power and domination are used. In word. And, 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 but that's not what I meant here. I tried to do that in reassembling the social. A large part of social theory is based on these two words, critique, domination, and power. And, and I'm suspicious of that for lots of reasons. The main reason is that what can be critique cannot be composed. And I think that's, that's, a more, that's maybe the argument which I sort of tried today around 16th century, which might be silly. But I read with great interest the book, by, which I didn't know, I should have known, by Stephen Tulmin on Cosmopolit, Cos, Cos, Cosmopolitis which is a very odd book, a very interesting book, which um, has a very interesting periodization of mo the modern, again, with uh, a very interesting argument about the scientific revolution between it being in the 16th century and not in the 17th century, and the 17th century being a counter-revolution. So in all of his argument, and 16th century is big on violence. So the way I would answer your question is when I found what the modern flee, fled from. And I said in this paper, I mean, great anthropological question is, what were they fleeing? Religious war, certainly. I mean, there's religious war was, uh, in, in Tulmin's argument. Uh, the, the, and now, of course, we have a religious war, we have a scientific war, we have the ecological war soon to come, and we have a usual political war. So I don't see my work as being sanitized, sanitized to the point of not talking about war, but I see war being distributed 
I, I'm always suspicious of when it's pointed at. Here is violence and domination. And here? What about here? You, you see why I hesitate? But I think it's a fair criticism, yeah. Yeah, it's a fair criticism. Not like the one before. <laughs> On parody, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm a professor of sociology and uh, I try to remember in my education if we mention sometime that people have become modern or if societies or the social have become modern. Uh, so to me, the question about we have never become modern, at least as a sociologist, it's quite strange because I could say the same about democracy. We have never been Democrats, but we have some kind of modern democracies. Uh, it seems to me that I know from your earlier works that you have deconstructed society, but it seems to me now that... We compose, not... Decompose. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I think you used the word at least in the Swedish translation, deconstruct. Ah. I'm not sure about it, but, but, uh, uh, but <laughs> it seems to me that you deconstruct society now, and the argument, or y y your arguments here, just are just created, because you deconstruct the social that much, that you start again to, to put it together. Of course, it is a kind of creativity, but why should we deconstruct society and the social that much? Uh, sometimes we need for, for a kind of uh, theoretical reasons to keep some elements of society uh, undeconstructed or <laughs> in, in some way. I think you, you deny uh, in some way, the existence of the social, that's why you create your problem. No, well, deconstructed is not the word I use. I mean, deconstructed, well, no, uh, there is enough deconstruction. I published a thousand page book called Iconoclash on precisely the question of why do we still want to destroy and deconstruct when everything has to be composed and reconstructed. So, I mean, maybe this is a Swedish translation, I don't know, but, uh, or maybe the history of Swedish destruction of Catholicism in their own iconoclastic. I know, li <laughs> I know too little about your iconoclasm crisis, so I don't know. Uh, even though I had the surprise in Lund of having an honorary degree given to me in Latin, which I was very surprised. So it not, has nothing to do with deconstruction, and it has nothing to do with the limit of the social. Actually, if anything, Actor Network is a fabulous expansion of the social to non-humans. So if we have done something, which is to, for a sociologist, which was limited to the human, it's now expanded. So you should thank me for having expanded your domain <laughs> quite a lot. And I define sociology as a science of associations, not of a social. And the reason why I doubt the notion of social in social explanation is not because it's bad, it's because it has to be refreshed. So the, the, my only argument but in another book, not in this thing here. Reassembling the social is the, the, the due date of social explanation. I just ask, could you sometimes, let's say, every five years or every six years, renew the content of what is used to explain something else? I mean, there is a due date for yogurt, there is a due date for frozen fishes. I mean, let's have a due date for social explanation. That's my argument, is, okay? So that we don't keep saying social explanation, social explanation, even after the due date, it's bad, it rots, I mean, it does all sorts of bad things. Now, my third more serious argument is that nature and society are the two collectors in which we organize the modernist constitution. But modernism is a constitution. It's an unwritten pact where you say, okay, there's two, two collectors, one is nature and one is society. Now, my sort of zeitgeist argument is, now with the ecological crisis, nature and society are not the two collectors to which we can attach our interpretation of what we live with. When, when I have Monsieur Sarkozy voting with, uh, in some strange 
commission of parliament that it should save the tuna fish, the red tuna, and of course fail on his promise. So that I have a tuna fish here and Mr. Sarkozy there attached to the same network and the same association. I don't want to have to say, because I'm a sociologist, Sarkozy here in society and this guy here, which is a natural thing, the fish is there. And in between there is something that only silly people like Actor Network ferries cross. <laughs> so if you have to choose between the separation and the association, I follow the association. That's my argument. Is, is it okay? I mean, I give you quite a lot of, of, of range. I mean, sociology is now able to follow precisely the moment when the fish gets into connection with the Elysee Palace. And we couldn't do that before. And actually, you use the same argument in your very exhibition below. You connect novel, novel with, it's actually said, the actors in the network. That's what we did. I mean, also these guys did. That's why science today is the best thing invented. And I think it should have a Nobel Prize, by the way. <laughs> For peace and literature. Yes, thank you for your talk. I have a question about the political significance of composition. Uh, you say that we have the political significance, and more concretely, what you mean by composition. You say that we have, you know, we should look back at the 16th century and Hannah Arendt writes that what happened in the 16th century was that we went from observation to experiment. When we discovered that the sun was not revolving around Earth, but we couldn't trust our senses anymore. We could not trust our senses, what we see. We have to start experimenting. So that when science went into experiencing, um, doing experiment. And the credo was that we cannot know what we have not ourselves made. We, well, we, we cannot it. know what we have not ourselves made. Uh -huh. yeah. So we have to sort of dig into, we must intervene into nature. And we cannot be sure, the skepticism that started with Descartes and so on. Now, that principle that we cannot know what we have not ourselves made, one could argue that that started in the 16th century has also been a very important political principle that sort of went into democracy. We have to take part in politics. We have to do democracy ourselves. So that sort of the emancipatory potential that started from that principle. Now, you seem to want to go back to this idea of observation. And you talk about aesthetics. And this is a movement coming very strong in global politics that we don't have to vote anymore, but we can observe. There's an aesthetics, people saying that we cannot have democracy on the global level. Anyone, we cannot make it there. And that's why I want to ask you, when you talk about composition, you move from to aesthetics. What does that mean precisely? I'm not sure I understand what the, where the observe, the, I mean, this is a very beautiful question, but where the observation argument comes in, because is this what you, you would associate with composition? Because composition seems to be a very active act of, I mean, it's used in music, it's used in di diplomacy, it's a very active word. If not, I, so I, I don't know where the observation gets, but your uh, verum factum argument gets very well with all the sort of ecological uh, argument. I mean, ecological arguments are very largely based on the, on the artificiality of this, association of natures and humans that we make, it seems to me. I mean, the, the idea, it seems to me the la large part of the ecological uh, critique is very rightly uh, a critique of the notion of wilderness, of the, of, the, of the thing that we would just be outside of. So, my argument, I, I'm, I'm not sure I get the gist of your question, it seems to me that, on the contrary, everything that says that we have to make the house, the ACOS in which we are, is what ecology is about. And here I'm, I, I would throw in, uh, I don't know if it's very popular in, in, in Sweden, but uh, I, I think the work that Peter Sloterdijk, I don't know how you pronounce here in, 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 in Sweden, uh, Peter Sloterdijk work on, on spheres and habitat and uh, artificial construction and nature being the artificial construction fits very well. The artificiality of a construction in which we are is no longer a problem when science, technology, and nature, so to speak, are, 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 have expanded, are coextensive. Or else I misunderstood entirely the question, or maybe I, 
it's my knowledge of the 16th century, which is too poor, which is perfectly possible. Uh, so it seems to me that on the contrary, see, I, I try to associate the great philosophical tradition of pragmatism, not only Dewey, but actually Lippmann. I'm a great fan of Lippmann. I translated it in French. And, and I did a whole exhibition uh, and a catalogue uh, making things public around Lippmann's argument about what it is to build the politics. And, and it seems to me that in the Phantom Public, which is a very little known book of, of Lippmann, there is a magnificent artificiality of building the phantom, the, the democracy. And, and Lippmann is a democrat, contrary to what people say. So I associate Lippmann with the... <laughs> I hook up Lippmann and Sloterdijk, if you want. And actually, in the show, Making Things Public, and in the catalog, we did connect these two great uh, thinkers together. Now, in your question, there is the notion of aesthetics, but aesthetics is nothing bad, is not, it has nothing to do with observation. It's a practice, and it's an experiment. And I, I think it is one of the essential experiments of building the space in which we now reside politically. And actually, in my school, I, I'm, I'm creating next year, next July, actually, a school of political art, precisely for this reason. Because the way we represent the problem is not the one we have in political arena only, nor in science, but in the connection between art, science, and politics. The way we represent the problem. And that's what I think it's so interesting to reconnect with the 16th century, actually. How do we represent the thing we disagree with? How do we represent matters of concern? I don't think we can do that without the artists. Not because they observe, but because they are a practice, and an, an experimental practice, as Dewey very nicely showed in, in art as experience. So I, I think there is a very interesting moment in, in, in especially in the ecology, all of this, of course, is completely, as we understood, predicated on the ecological crisis. If you are like the former minister of, of, of science in France, Claude Allegre, who did with, with a negationist, uh, I mean, you just go on. <laughs> French as usual. But if you are interested, in the, if you are sensitive to the ecological crisis, the, the artist has a way to represent, present again, the primary, which are difficult to represent politically and scientifically, seems to be an essential part of the argument. And that's why, again, composition, as I said to this gentleman, for me is a nice word, but I'm, maybe we'll discuss afterward because I might have misunderstood where the observation argument gets in. And I don't, I want to, Get me, in case I made a mistake in my connotation of the word composition. Um, yeah, um, I'm Hendrik Ernst, I'm from Stockholm Resilience Center. I'm studying um, urban ecologies and the politics of the organization of urban ecologies, uh, which is a good place to start because everything is so composed and unnatural in some ways. At the same time, I have colleagues are doing excellent uh, research on, on a global scale and um, right in the spot of the ecological crisis. Um, so my question is, if we want to sensitize this, um, uh, this dialogue on the ecological crisis to that a lot of that knowledge is composed as well, how we know about the ecological crisis, what kind of research projects are important to engage in and how do you do that kind of research? Um, because at the same time, we have this ecological crisis, it also seems to drive this idea of nature as out there in the sense that it invests more and more money and resources into uh, sort of big science projects. So trying to establish facts and not um, engage in matters of concern. So my question is, it seems that you are putting um, the argument that the ecological crisis is in a sense so big, so that will, this nature, this uh, science society divide will evaporate in front of this ecological crisis. But at the same time, I can see the tendencies how it sort of, uh, you get more and more resources from society investing in these big time big science projects. 
So as a, as a young scholar that wants to understand how can I engage in these debates, what are the good kind of projects to sensitize these debates to become more open to this uh, kind of research and the composition of uh, arguments that you're arguing for? Thank you. Well, first, I'm sorry, I have no time to visit the Resilience Center, but I'll come back to visit it because that's one of my plans is to visit your center, like the one in Munich, and, and because I want to build one in Paris, so I need to get your expertise. So I'd rather ask you a question than give you a question. One of the interesting things on composition is, of course, that the question of size, which is so difficult in the case of ecological crisis itself to be composed, so that there is no nesting between the small and the big because every di discipline and every topic actually has a different scale. Uh, the tuna fish inhabits Sarkozy's Elysee Palace in very different ways from the H1N1 or, um, and, of course, the volcano ash from <laughs> volcano. <laughs> so, there is a whole, fact, this is also why the notion of, of, of disconnect and, and, and is, is, is useful, is that the size of it. Now, it's not a contrast, it's a contrast, it's not an opposition between matters of fact and matters of concern. You don't shift from matters of fact to matters of concern by decreasing the constraint, by increasing the constraints. And, I mean, the book I wrote called Politics of Nature is based, although it's not clear in the book, on, on, on a lot of field work we did in my center uh, at, at, at Le Mines. And what I propose is, is that precisely we replace the question of science and politics by the question of how many people, how many agency do we connect and can we make a hierarchy out of it? In other words, so, I mean, it's a very odd way to answer your question, but it means that the, the, the matters of concern is not a, a sort of addition of social science to the fact defined by naturalists, because that will never work. I worked for many years with a guy who was the head of Kenya uh, Wild Animal Park called David Worston, and uh, the wilderness, he was in charge of wilderness and, of course, acting constantly in order to maintain the wilderness constantly changing. So this is the normal thing. And we studied, actually, he studied a very nice case where a very rich billionaire had bought a large bit of land and surrounded it with a, with, a, with a barrier. And in six months, there was no wildlife in it, which was, it is why he developed the whole, the whole theory of parks outside a uh, park. And it's clear that, I mean, this guy publishes paper with Maasai farmers. It's a very interesting case. I mean, he publishes uh, simultaneously. I mean, he's, he's an allometrician, the one who, who tried to get the measure, uh, the laws of, of measure uh, between uh, entities. And he's also writing papers with Maasai, which is quite an interesting <laughs> contribution. And it's actually the book, uh, Politics of Nature, is dedicated to him. Because I think he has found a solution to that, the question you raised, which is, uh, Compos if we want to get into composition, we have to abandon the idea of a divide between fact and, and, and value, which is, which is behind, which is a sort of popularized version of a bifurcation of nature. Not, not to politicize the fact, but to ask a completely different a question which are completely uh, diagonal to that, which is the two tasks... Anyway, I mean, you can read the book. It's, I'm not going to summarize the book. It's, but I don't want to ask you to answer your question because I'd like really to get at, to see what sort of study you do. I invite me to your centers and I would love to comment on the studies and, try, and I'll try to borrow your research protocol for my own purposes. <laughs> if it's okay with you. It's not that I want to avoid, evade the question, it's that that's a really interesting question, are empirical, and I don't want to preempt them too fast. And these are really serious questions. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Uh, thank you very much for reassembling some, some of our ideas about human agency. It seems to me that part of your cosmopolitics and your, uh, well, what's that, mani is partly also a humanist manifesto in some ways, in that when you kind of expand the extant network from the social also into the human sciences. One of the things you're doing is that you're providing a renaissance for representation, representation that is, and for a novel focus on plans, drafts, 
regulations and for aesthetic judgments. And uh, so my question to you is, would you agree that to some extent this is a way of bringing actant networks from the technical and social partly back to the human through uh, emphasizing agency and plans and composition to some extent, to, to a greater extent. I'm not completely sure I got the question though. So I, I agree with having plants and humans. Uh, it seems to me that uh, your focus on composition uh, makes a greater place or more place for studying and working and looking at human uh, plans, intentions, uh, regulations, uh, aesthetic judgments, to bring human sciences into the social and technical sciences, I or to reconnect uh, the human with the social and the technical. Well, I'm not sure, maybe I'm too tired, but the question is agency has to be redistributed and the divide between type of agencies, I mean, this is a discussion we had in science study for many years. When Max Weber says, uh, when the bicycle falls down, it's not anything social, but when the cyclist stops at a sign, it's social, I disagree, and I think Trevor Pinch disagree, and lots of other people disagree, and say the bicycle itself, the making of a bicycle, every single aspect of it is association, which has been in which agency is to be distributed throughout. So, and I said here more, the question of the invention of the inanimate is what is to be studied anthropologically and not the remnant of animism into rational thinking. When, especially when you are yourself studying scientists who are making agencies proliferate. I mean, this is what is so surprising when you study so-called reductionist biologists the proliferation of extra, the extra proliferation of agencies through the laboratory, of course. The laboratory is the great product producers of multiple agencies. So this disconnect between the practice of proliferation agencies and, oh, no, 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 there is a strict difference between bicycles and bicyclists, is what my object of study. Why agencies being distributed in very interesting way and yet they are not supposed to be distributed? That's the puzzle. And I add a little urgency to this puzzle by saying, politically it's very odd to live with the ecological crisis with the definition of agencies which dates back from the time of murder, which never happened in addition. That's what my answer is. Thank you, Thank you very much for...